Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and we're so glad you're with us today to stay curious. We've got a special guest with us, Mr. Steve Lloyd. Hello, Steve. Great to see you. Glad Welcome. to be back today. Well, good. Steve uh, has something to do with the discovery being at Udbar Hazy, as we see the roll in picture there. Thank you, the Usiak brothers in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, for documenting that and letting us share. There's the cabin behind my my big head there. Steve, we're so glad to have you here. As you see there, he's Chief Engineer and Senior Vice President of All Points Logistics, a fabulous company that's come on the rise here in the rocket renaissance, doing all kinds of things. We'll talk about that towards the end of the program, because Steve had an illustrious career during the shuttle era, and he's a second generation uh, with his dad, uh, being an Apollo Guy, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but uh, good to have you here. Steve is also one of our board members at the American Space Museum. He's been on the board four years. So tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how you got in the space business, Steve. Well, you know, I've got to start with my dad, right? You know, he moved our family down here in the late 60s because he wanted to get involved in the space program. <clears throat> and, you know, so fortunately, I was exposed to it from an early age, and I was in elementary school when we came down here. So I got to grow up around the space program. My dad was enthralled with it. He was always working around the space program, either out at the Space Center or, or associated with it. So I got to grow up on the Space Coast here. I got to enjoy, you know, the Apollo launches and then the early days of the shuttle program. And so uh, very fortunate to, to, uh, to feel like having been a, a child of the Apollo era. Well, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that, being a baby boomer in the Apollo era myself. Uh, uh, and uh, we're going to talk about that, uh, about your dad here in a minute and your family. Did want to get a little plug in there early of our show that we're having a memorabilia auction on Saturday, February 18th. Go to AmericanSpaceMuseum.org and you can pre-bid there. And you being one of the board members... Uh, Steve, this is important to keeping our doors open. We can't emphasize how this has become the main fundraiser for our humble nonprofit. Yeah, no, the, the museum does tremendous things, right? I mean, obviously maintaining the legacy and the history of the space program, but also more importantly to today's efforts is the STEM for getting the next generation of space workers uh, into the pipeline, right? So. The Space Museum, again, does a lot of really good things, but we can't do it without support from the public, right? We can't do it without membership, without people visiting the museum or people just making donations. So, you know, uh, these types of events, exactly like the the auctions, are how we keep the doors open. Exactly. And if you have some expendable income you want to hide from, not hide, shouldn't say that, <laughs> get away from the tax man, You'd be happy to know that the American Space Museum has earned a Give With Confidence rating of 95 out of 100 from Charity Navigator, one of those watchdogs of nonprofits out there. And uh, like our, the board of directors that you're on, uh, Steve, is among them a who's who of some of the past and present things going on in the space business, correct? Absolutely. You know, I, I feel honored to walk into the board meetings because of the people that are here on the board. And, and we're the folks talking Bob Seek launched 56 shuttles. He's segueing off with Lee Solid many years on our board, the rocket guy, the Saturn V. But you got uh, David Mandernick that's got a, uh, a, a satellite facility here. Uh, and the chairman of the board, Larry Osterley, mm -hmm. uh, no slouch there being a Debus Award winner. Right. Right. And so it is a who's who of who's been around here for a while. And, you know, again, one thing we're always looking for is is other folks that would be interested in helping uh, support and, and uh, continue the effort. Well, good enough for that in our public relations of our museum there. But happy to have quality people like Steve wanting to lead this uh, museum under our director, Karen Conklin, who, of course, has been so passionate about this museum for over two decades and uh and it's it's just a blessing to be involved in it steve on the level that i am learning things every day and sharing with our stay curious audience a fabulous story you're going to hear about steve and his father here so tell us about your father uh who uh this was taken a couple years ago all points did a wonderful uh overview of the apollo era as well as 
the, the future there. So your dad named Paul there. He's how old now? He is 96 years old, 96 years young, and uh, still going strong, still maintains his same enthusiasm for space. Uh, so, so a real space nut, huh? Oh, absolutely. You know, he's one of I, the story's kind of funny. He's got a regular TV at home, and he's got another TV that he uses for watching NASA Select and stuff like that so he can keep up to speed on everything. Interesting. And like you said, uh, he got snapped up by Pan American uh, right there in 1968. And a lot of people think of Pan American as flying planes, but tell us they had a big role in Apollo. Oh, yeah. They, they managed a lot of the non-flight hardware type stuff. In fact, one of the things that he did early on was uh, uh, helping uh, set up and reconfigure some of the uh, some of the downrange systems. So he ended up uh, working at Antigua for oh. a little bit of time early on in the career. Well, maybe you've taken a little vacation cruise to Antigua <laughs> there. Yes, it wasn't a hard work to be on these early communication satellites that were strung out down the the down the, the range, islands, down the range, down yeah. range there. And uh, so uh, did your family go there with your dad or? Well, he had to live there by himself, but we did get to go spend one Christmas with him down there. So, uh, you know, it was it was great to get down there. And, and uh, how and big is your family, your your mom and dad's family? It, it was just uh, my mom and dad and me and my sister. So okay. it was just the four of us. All right, cool. Uh, we wanted to. And so you then got involved uh your first job we're going to talk about here in a second but uh i want to show you the um three generations there what are we looking at there well that's a picture of of myself and my dad and then my oldest son Corey, and one of his friends and we did that when uh, we were getting ready to uh start transitioning some of the the shuttle activity and they had an opportunity to for me to take my dad back out there and uh, let him get on center and see some of the hardware again. So when you got hired out there, you actually crossed paths with your dad, right? Yeah, well, yeah. when I first got out of school, I went off and, and I, I had a different job. I did seismic exploration. So I went and spent about seven or eight years around the world doing uh, oil and gas type stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, little did I know when I did that, you know, how important that was going to be because some of the work that I did there was very relevant to what I ended up doing when I joined the space program, right? Which was uh, a lot of navigation uh, and uh, technical stuff. Back then, you know, the the oil and gas industry had all the money in the world. So I was exposed to high tech equipment and, and state of the art equipment. And then coming back here and deciding that it was time to come back to Florida, it provided me a great opportunity to, to kind of segue right into the space program. And and more importantly than that, it gave me the opportunity when I was overseas to to, to meet my wife. And so, you know, then it's, uh, that was one of the, the you great You met things. your wife overseas? Yeah. Yeah. I met my wife when uh, I was living in Venezuela. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's love can be found all over the world, <laughs> huh? In there. Yep. Uh, I had to search the world. You grew up the in right the one. Carolinas and you find. That's where I was born, right? Oh, yeah. born. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. actually grew up in. See, he, he grew up in Florida. Quickly correct yeah. me on that there. <laughs> Uh, a lot of astronauts born somewhere else and moved, you know, like a lot of families, one or two years old and grew up somewhere else. But wherever they're born, they claim them, mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. on there. Uh, well, Steve, you were involved uh, with the, the shuttle uh, era, and we love celebrating the great shuttle uh, era of three decades that I keep harping about has changed our 21st century the way we have. It's molded our society in ways that we talked about. Uh, that you don't understand, like the Defense Department missions during the Reagan and uh, first Bush administrations. It definitely changed the attitude of the United Socialist Republic of Russia. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we're proud about the 11 shuttles of the month. All five orbiters flew in the month of February. And Steve, on our program, we kind of go through and let people know. Uh, just not the astronauts, but the missions involved there. And uh, two that are in the month in when I showed you our, our mem there, you said that, yeah, you worked on directly on how many shuttles? About 75 or 80. I don't have mm -hmm. exactly the number, but it was quite a few. The 135 shuttle fleet there. Two of them launched just uh, in the next uh, last day or two. February 7th is uh, this mission, STS-122. Uh, and that one uh, then... Uh, on February 8th, yesterday, 1.30 was launched, the last hardware to be taken up 
the cupola. This, that is the, the emblem there uh, on the cupola. And as I slide by this picture, you and your dad there, that I have out of sequence there, but uh, good to see your dad there. You've done many interviews with him, I understand, and stuff. So. Well, I've done a couple, but, uh, you know, he's a phenomenal individual. And so, you know, uh, it's just a pleasure to be able to, to capture some of these things with him. Absolutely. Well, tell us about your, one of your uh, positions was the uh, Transoceanic uh, Abort Landing Sites. The acronym is TAL. And here is a map showing all the landing sites that the shuttle could do, right? Going up the coast. Right, right. So the shuttle program had a, had a, a number of landing sites. Some were instrumented and some weren't. Uh, but when I first came into the shuttle program, that's what I did was to support the uh, the landing sites. Not only the ones that were CONUS, the ones here in the United States. CONUS. Got to yeah. got correct those acronyms. Yeah, yeah. CONUS. CONUS is continental United States. So here in right. Florida, and we had White Sands in, out at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Now it's Armstrong. But, uh, and then we had the ones that were overseas. Uh, and here in, those are here on this picture there. Right. you got to understand that when a shuttle was launched, if one of them or two of those engines went out, they had to have an abort situation. And that's what this is all about. Uh, uh, and depending on the inclination of the orbit, there you see the ISS orbit inclination. Uh, you're, land you're landing in Europe or Africa, maybe. <laughs> it was always a... Well, we never had to do it, which was a great thing, yeah. but it was always there just in case. So you had to be in these horrible places like Marrakesh, uh, Morocco, or Zaragoza, Spain, or uh, uh, which I'm being facetious there. They'd all be cool places to just go to Casablanca while you're waiting for the shuttle to come in. Yeah, those were... Explain uh, that little bit of uh, NASA workers. Important, uh, of course, to be there. Well, we had to have uh, complete teams at each one of these sites if it was required. So we had the folks that were there to be prepared if there was an emergency landing. It wasn't just shuttle folks. We had some folks from the DOD that could do some some rescue if needed, if everything didn't work right. And then we had folks that were there to help get the shuttle on the ground, our navigational aids. And that was one of the areas that I was most predominantly involved with. So we had the ability to help guide them into the runways and then secure the, the hardware and the shuttle and the people in the event that they did need to land there. So these different locations were, were spread out as needed. And we had a pretty big team that went out there every time for uh, preparations. And sometimes we were there for three or four weeks. Our good friend, Dean Schaff, who you know real well, you yeah. worked with him as a GOM, a ground operations manager, right? Yeah. A GOM, that's one of my favorite acronyms to say. Uh, so when you're here, Marty, and uh, hadn't said hi to Marty today. Marty, hello there. Marty worked on those shuttle engines, and uh, you know Steve pretty well. Well, I, I don't know how well I know him, but I do know him. He's a board member, Marty. We know him <laughs> real well. He's a great guy. <laughs> Well, not to know he's not a great guy. But, uh, well, Marty you know. spent 30 years on the uh, launch processing services there as a manager, about 40 people on those shuttle engines, the greatest rocket engine ever made, I think. And uh, so does Lee Solid, by yep, the way. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but so, Marty, you'd be over here waiting the beautiful weather here. You're ready to launch that shuttle in the mid morning. And there's a no go because of the weather over at. Ben Guerrero or, or Zaragoza or something. That's the way it went, right? If they couldn't land the shuttle safely, and boy, this is one of the landing sites I'm showing you in Gambia. All right, that's you barely land a, a, a 727 on that probably. But uh, so yes, the weather overseas. Tell us about that. Well, those the sites were selected primarily for their location, you know, and and so we always had more than one site. So if the weather was bad in one location, we would have another location that was still available. So, you know, unless we had weather or some conditions that would preclude us from being able to use those, uh, you know, those were rarely uh, uh, an issue where we wouldn't be able to support the launch. Mm -hmm. But once in a while it would be, and people would be oh, scratching absolutely. their heads. It's beautiful here. Why are we scrubbing, you know? Yeah, well, because the weather overseas was. If they lost one engine, they barely make it over the Atlantic Ocean. The way mm -hmm. I understand it, correct? And and We're that was something. On the payload, yeah. That was some. Yeah, depending on the, how heavy the payload was, and the orbit that they were inclined to go take that payload. 
Uh, so uh, very, I love the, the towel, transoceanic abort landing sites. And that's a very important part. And uh, when they were building Vandenberg to, to launch, uh, Dean Schaff told me those towel sites, one would probably been Hawaii. Well, we did have sites for DOD missions. So we had a we had a landing site in Hawaii at Hickam Air Force Base, and we had uh, an Anderson, which was in Guam. But those were specifically for DOD missions because they wanted to have the ability to land a shuttle in those locations because they would have had DOD payloads, but they wanted them to be on a U.S. military DOD installation in that event. So we did set those up. But after we uh, finished flying DOD payloads, then uh, we de decommissioned those sites. Hmm. And there was actually a net, folks, that they would deploy uh, to catch the shuttle in some of these short runways. We, we're we going to have another program on that with Dean Schaff, but uh, we did do a, a wonderful Stay Curious with him a little over a year ago. But we're now going to show some pictures that uh, you sent me of uh, back in time. Oh, those days <laughs> of our when our hair was beautiful color and we were stealth. And there you are. Where are you and what the heck you doing there, Steve? Well, I, I think that is in uh, Marrakesh. And what that was is we had equipment that was out along the runway and obviously we needed to have power. And so we had you know a lot of equipment that we needed to, to put in place and maintain to, to power the equipment. And I think that's a power distribution unit that we had set up along the runway. Interesting there. And, you know, it's not like uh, we're talking 30 years ago, 25 years ago, of course. Um, people just didn't whip out cameras and take pictures like they do today. You know, we were commenting in our little pre-production meeting here. You wish you had more pictures of some of the things. Well, you had to, had to take a picture and then get it printed out. Yeah. But today, the digital era has changed that. It certainly has. And uh, so glad you're sharing this. Here's an interesting picture of... Tell us what that is and where you were. I think that's at Ellington at uh, Johnson Space Center. So that's a picture of a T-38. And, and those were the taxis that the astronauts used to, to not only train, but to, to travel around to the different locations and stuff. And so uh, actually took that picture when, uh, when we were out there for a celebration. And if you probably want to see a lot of astronauts, be a jet mechanic on these things. You'd <laughs> see them all the time. And like Steve said, this is sort of their private taxi to go around to the private, the, the contractor bases around the country where each astronaut would be assigned a specific duty or, or system to understand, mm -hmm. and they'd be going and watching that be right. put together, Supplier right? Supplier interactions. Uh, well, and you got some good stories here. Here's a, there's a great photo of you working there. When he did work, folks, those of you that know <laughs> Steve out there, uh, yes, tell us what's going on there. And why would someone take a picture of you doing that? Like well, because they probably want to catch me working, right? <laughs> that was exactly. a hard thing to do. But no, that is, uh, that's actually a picture of the NASA C-130. One of the things that we had to do was to certify the navigational aid systems at all of these different sites. And so uh, every year we would load equipment onto a to the NASA C-130, and we would go around and certify the accuracy of these systems. And so... Uh, that happens to be a picture of us installing and checking out some of the hardware that we had to to mount on that plane in order to accomplish those tasks. Hmm. And how did it work out? Good, right? Yeah, no, it was uh, it, it was a uh, uh, a lot of of preparation to go do this because we had to load up the equipment and the whole crew and fly around to all of these different locations, and we had to do it every two year. The certification was a two year period, and as mm -hmm. everybody's been on the space program in one fashion or another understands that, you know, certifications are just part of life. That's what you have to do to make sure that the hardware is operating properly. And that type of certification, Steve, carried on to the aviation industry. Of course, it's National Aeronautics and Aviation Association, uh, our space administration. I mean, they, uh, that makes us feel good, all these certifications when you're flying all over the world like you have, obviously. You must have a lot of Miles racked up over your lifetime. Yeah, I've spent a few hours on planes. You know, the one thing that's uh, kind of cool about this is, as we were doing this, we were one of the first groups within NASA to use GPS to kind of determine the aircraft's position. And, and ultimately, later on, we were able to take that technology 
and uh, implemented into the shuttle so that it was able to rely on GPS for some of its navigation in the later days. Interesting. Very good. We're starting with Steve Lloyd here, as they says their chief engineer of All Points Logistics. We'll talk about the company he's, he's uh, one of the leaders at now that's doing great things in our rocket renaissance. But Steve, it's all built on the, the, the past, is it not? Sure. Our, our future here, and like you, you're talking about GPS being an infant thing in the shuttle, they would never think of not putting that on a... No, it's just commonplace. Everybody, you use it in your car every day, you know, when, when you ask Siri to take you someplace, it's yeah. all based on, on uh, that technology. Well, you also had another interesting uh, part of your career there. Uh, and we have a couple of pictures to show what you're doing here. Well, that, as I mentioned, that was one of the things that we did. We traveled around every two years to these sites and, and we had equipment in the plane. And that's just a picture of our team up in the plane collecting data as we flew around and monitored the hardware that we had and, and calibrated it so that we had a high confidence level that if needed, the, uh, the systems were able to perform to support landings, to support a shuttle landing. So that's in the 1990s, probably there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just I look I like looking around at the hardware and things you're using, and and uh, doesn't look too much different than today. No, we were pretty cutting edge from a technology perspective because you know it wasn't stuff that flew in space, so we had a little bit more latitude. And so I think that was in the 90s. And again, you know, we had a lot of equipment that that we had to put on these aircraft. We used a NASA C-130 for a while. And at one point we used the Vomit Comet because it was available and it was capable of carrying the equipment and crew that we needed to go do these things. Cool. Interesting. There. And, and uh, look at his youthful smile there. You got a nice yeah. mustache there too, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it wasn't uh, wasn't all gray. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I can relate to that on there. Well, as we look at the uh, Udvar Hazy hangar there where they the uh, Discovery now sits, uh, uh, orbital vehicle 103 on its tail number there. Uh, Steve, tell us a little bit about your involvement with uh, the Columbia accident. Uh, you had a, a role to play in there uh, with the uh, uh, the reconstruction project as well as the wing designs, right? Yeah, when uh, when we lost Columbia, I was still doing the the, the landing aids, navigational aids activity. In fact, I uh, I was on console that day for the landing and uh, it was mm -hmm. my son's birthday. And I told my wife oh. when I left to go to work that morning, I said, I'll be home this afternoon as soon as the landing. And as, as we all understand, the landing didn't happen. So, you know, I had to call and say, well, hey, I just don't know when I'm going to be back home. And so uh, uh, it was a sad day because that's one of the first things that that you heard when we were landing the shuttle was one of the call outs that you would hear was take. TACAN, right? And TACAN was one of the navigational aids that reached out the further. So as soon as they came into into the atmosphere, that was their first navigational aid that they would use to determine their position. And so, you know, unfortunately that day it uh, we lost them and, and they never got to that point. It broke up before they got to the point where they would take that, which was normally out over the Gulf of Mexico. Hmm. Well, we've uh, celebrated that, uh, the lives of these wonderful astronauts at Columbia, Challenger, and uh, the Apollo 1 uh, just a couple of weeks ago at Sandpoint Park. Yep. You were involved in that. Uh, I think it's good that, that we have these memorials. Oh, absolutely. You know, I was fortunate to, to lay a, a, a flower down for Rick Husband. Yeah, he was a commander. So. Right, yeah. Yeah, so yeah what important. a guy Rick Husband was. In, yes, in absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's, it's something that I've learned working at this museum five years is is these tragedies, uh, they hit hard there. Uh, it makes my skin crawl thinking about what you all went through as you're standing on the runway, waiting to hear the double sonic booms and people like yourself. I mean, you knew immediately that it was wrong. Something was wrong. Yeah. And, and when you're going 5,000 miles an hour in a hundred ton spaceship, uh, there's not much forgiveness not there, much room for uh, in there. So, uh, but uh, how do you feel that, that that we've moved on the last 20 years from that, Steve? Well, that's a pretty broad question, right? I mean, obviously, every major event we've learned from it, and we've learned a lot, and we continue to learn a lot. So that's the most important part. That as we go through these tragedies, that you come out on the other side with an understanding that you can apply to the to the future programs, and so. Uh, 
fortunately, you know, uh, I think we've learned enough. We flew out the rest of the shuttle program without any incident. So mm-hmm. I'd say that was one of the the the, the big uh, lessons learned was how to do things differently or, or to make sure that those types of things didn't happen again. And you helped improve the leading edge of the shuttle. Tell us about that investigation you're involved in. Right. Well, as as some people may remember, you know, the cause of that of us losing Columbia was a piece of foam that flew off of the external tank mm-hmm. and hit the leading edge and and uh, knocked a hole in it. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we didn't have any way back then to uh, to measure that, to understand what really happened. And and so after uh, after we lost Columbia, one of the things I did is I changed positions. I went over and I was managing an engineering group that did the instrumentation and the computer systems on the shuttle program. So that was my job. And so uh, as a result of the investigation and determination of what caused it, uh, there was corrective action. And one of it was to to put sensors all down the leading edge of the of the fleet so that if we did have a reoccurrence of that, that we could measure, we would know exactly what happened. Mm. And so, you know, it was a it was an improvement to the safety of the systems, right? Uh, the one thing that I thought was really cool was, you know, we got to go inside of the the wings on all of the shuttles and and put all the sensors along the leading edge. And and you don't think about, you know, look at a shuttle. Most people don't appreciate the size of it, but you could go inside of these wings and stand up. And even out towards the leading edge where we put all the instrumentation, there was still, I mean, you had to get down and crawl, but it's, huh. it's it was pretty pretty large, those, those the, the caverns inside of the wings. I never heard about standing up inside of the wings. And as I consult my shuttle scroll here, uh, those wings are 78 feet across. And uh, uh, the, the, the uh, it's a, the cabin's 23 feet above the ground there. I have my head. The cabin's 23 feet. So, yeah, you would have six foot, seven feet. Well, right they, they were, you, you accessed a wing just up through the wheel wells. And so it was pretty, it was a pretty high area right there. Now, they obviously taper down pretty quickly. But uh, it was an interesting project. And again, uh, that was one of those lessons learned that enabled us to make sure that we had a, another margin of, of safety uh, for us to fly out to the rest of the programs. Uh, good. And the, uh, well, the bittersweet moment was retiring the fleet in 2011. And, uh, we've got, uh, tell us about your involvement with that. And we've got this picture here that, um, uh, let me show that picture there. Yeah. So, so one of the things that I was fortunate to do at the end was be really involved in, uh, the closeout of the shuttle program. We called it transition and retirement. So one of the things that we were responsible to do was kind of take an inventory of all the assets that the shuttle program had in it. Obviously, the the orbiters were a big piece of it, but we had a lot of facilities, a lot of ground support equipment and infrastructure and people. The most important part was people. And one of the things that we did was go through and determine, well, what is the best thing for us to do with this hardware or these assets or these people after we finished flying the shuttle program. So this picture is uh, a great picture because this was part of the team that we used to uh, collect a bunch of information because one of the things important, you can have a piece of hardware, but if you don't have all the supporting information, uh, it make it very difficult for it to be repurposed or reused in the future. So the team that you got there uh, were amazing, amazing group of folks that we used to kind of make sure that we had all the right information and we put it together to include the orbiters and, and how we dispositioned and what we did. The, and we had the right uh, collection of information to go along with them. Marty, you're closer there. Would you read what the, the placards say there? Yeah, it says, Smithsonian, please embrace, cherish, love, and learn from her as we have loved DPT. That uh, just that gets me just reading that, Steve. Really, the 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 love that these space workers had for these orbiters—they were part of your family. Right, right. It was, and and these folks we worked very very closely together. This was one of the one of the teams that spent a lot of time making sure that that we did the best thing that we could with the with the mm-hmm. assets that were that were going to be no longer needed. 
I'd love to be on a team like that. Seven women for every man. <laughs> well, there, they weren't a, all like that. that be, oh, okay. <laughs> I was fortunate to be the... Well, I like you know, working yeah, for women, yeah, I guess. Yeah. But <laughs> had to point that out there. But yeah, what a cool moment in time there to, that you all took time to do that, uh, to make these little little signs and line up. I mean, really, think about that, folks. This is how our our space workers love what they do and they know what they're doing is improving uh, just not America, but the world. Yeah. Step by step, really changing yeah. our society. Now, the, the whole team that was involved <clears throat> in the, the shuttle program closeout and the transition and retirement, you know, did did a phenomenal amount of work because uh, <clears throat> everybody would previous was focused on the day to day things now. But when we got to that point, everybody had to kind of lift their head up and think about, well, what can we do with these things going forward? What kind of information is going to be needed? And so, uh, and it wasn't just at Kennedy Space Center. It was across all of the inst the installations that uh, sh supported the shuttle program. So hmm. it was a phenomenal task, and, and I was very fortunate to be involved and in, in be in a leadership role for that. Well, you obviously did a good job. This is out on the shuttle runway at KSC mm -hmm. before it was taken off to go to Udvar Hazy in, in Smithsonian, 39 flights of that beautiful spaceship. Look at the patina on it there from the re-entries and, and all of that. Just uh, this was uh, deployed the Hubble telescope, our return to flight twice after mm -hmm. the disasters. That, that is that bird right there. I think it was the queen of the fleet, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and uh, here it is flying over our nation's capital. That was... Uh, didn't grab the exact date. I'll bet Tom Usiak knows what, what day that was because I think these are Tom's and Mark's pictures of it as they were at that event. Uh, and then it come in the runway or in this permanent home there, which uh, I've been privileged to see. And there you got a couple dozen astronauts uh, in front of Discovery, which it replaced Enterprise. Uh, at to Udvar has it. and then Enterprise, I believe, is on a in New York City in the mm -hmm. harbor right. there. Yep. On, on Enterprise, it's on an aircraft carrier. What's it sitting on? Uh, Someone will tell us here in a minute. Yeah, but. I don't know if it's an aircraft carrier or if it's on a, a floating platform there. I don't remember. Long time since you had that many <laughs> astronauts in one place, though. Yeah, and that was over ten years ago. <clears throat> so. You know what's really impressive about the you know before we sent the orbiters off to their final destinations, one of the things we did was strip out a lot of the critical engines and plumbing hardware. And actually the the Artemis mission that just flew, flew uh, the engines and some of the, the plumbing that came out of those the shuttle program at the end. That's great. That's great that it lives on. Marty, you got a comment or question over there for Steve or myself? No, it's a comment from Doug Forrest. Uh, Apparently, Discovery is on Intrepid. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Doug Forrest is an uh, artist and uh, uh, an art director in uh, Los Angeles yeah. out there. And, yeah, the Intrepid, that, that makes sense out there. Have you seen it on there, Marty? I need to go there. and I really want to see the Cradle of Aviation Museum uh, in Long Island. Yeah, we need to take a trip up there. Yeah, we do, don't we? We need to take a road trip here. As well as other places. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And we need a good camera to take on the road and get our board of directors to okay that so we can outreach for the... Yeah, we'll get you yeah. a check. We'll get you a check, <laughs> you, Steve. Well, uh, you know, you want to. your shuttle career was a, a good one, and you were recognized at the highest level, Steve uh, Lloyd has been. This is the Snoopy Award. And uh, we have in our museum, uh, the Workers' Gallery, we honor uh, the Snoopy Award there. In fact, we got Norm Carlson's just flown Snoopy Award there. Why don't you tell us, everybody, what the Snoopy Award is? And, and uh, there's Butch Wilmer uh, signed that for you. What does that mean to you, and how how did you get that? Well, that, that particular award, again, I was very honored to receive that Snoopy Award. I think is the second highest award that they provide to to the contractor team that are out there. This one, I actually uh, got awarded for the participation okay. in doing the uh, transition and retirement activity. Okay. And uh, as you can see, there was uh, there, fortunate the, to have uh, some, some of the, the team that was there to present it. Bob Cabana, which is now our uh, associate, uh, uh, associate uh, for human space flight. Up number in three in command of yep, NASA. Right. Yep. Mark Pam Melroy and of course Nelson. 
Yeah, uh, Mark Nappy, he's a uh, program manager for the Boeing Space Program here locally. And Rhea Wilcoxon was an, a NASA uh, okay. leader. And, and then... Uh, astronaut the Butch Wilmer there. Yes, yes. You had to be sponsored by an astronaut. He sponsored you. A little nice little Snoopy pen went up in space that... Uh, is that in your sock drawer or do you? Well, that's, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I try to keep a, a box of all the most important memorabilia. And, and that's absolutely one of those keepsakes that I have that we'll pass down to the family. Good. Because it's, uh, that your boys know that that's yeah. uh, what that's all it's about. There. There. Yeah. Butch Wilmer, by the way, is going to be the commander of the Boeing Starliner with a very popular and awesome astronaut, Suni Williams, going beside him on that. Have you heard anything about a launch date for that in the inner circles of your world? Uh, not all the specifics, but again, you know, it's kind of uh, ironic that that Mark and Butch, you know, are working together because Mark is the program manager for that program now. So, uh, and I do keep in touch with Mark on time to time mm -hmm. basis, and so I think they're they're planning to try to fly later this year. Yeah, I hope by I thought summertime time, was yep. uh, yep. Uh, uh, looking around there. Marty, we got a comment from. Our Stay Curious Watchers. Yeah, Tom Celentano said April 19th, 2012 was the date of the ceremony with Discovery arriving and Enterprise departing used by Hazy. Oh, thank you for adding and that. Then, April of 2012 there. That makes sense to you, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, Time Carlton, for the Cherry Festival in New York or uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah, Carlton Bailey volunteered to uh, go along with us on our trip as our personal paparazzi. Oh, good, Carlton. Yes, we would love that. All right. We don't have enough people with cameras uh, around us these days. Carlton's an excellent launch photographer and and a good friend of our museum, as you well know, on there. Well, you got another award here. He not got the number two award. Let me go back here. But you also got the number one Space Flight Awareness Award there. And tell us a little about this and what you do to be honored that way, Steve. Well, I was extremely honored to get that award. And, and uh that was earlier on in my career and i got that award for for designing and developing a system to help with the certification of those nav aid systems we had an uh, issue where we couldn't get the, the flights uh and the, the crew and the planes all together so i had put together and designed and deployed a system where we could do it actually on the ground and so uh, i got that award because it gave us a lot of flexibility to, to be able to go do these types of certifications uh, as needed, and uh, and it saved us a lot of money and time because we didn't have to always deploy these aircraft and the systems associated with them to every location mm -hmm. every time. So that very, was a key thing to get cool these awards was saving money, yes. right? Yes, save money and time. and and and, in, and increase the confidence in that we could meet the mission. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations on that. Good, good for you there, and. Uh, uh, now you can put those back in the closet, right where they were. <laughs> those actually, that, those those hang in my office today. Good, well, as they well should. There, yeah. as, as they should. Uh, Marty's handing me, uh, who is watching today, as we're going to segue into what you're doing now. We're glad that Dave Calloway was looking forward to today's show. Maris Krasinski is watching from Poland. All right, and. Uh, Doug Forrest, we talked about in L.A. Dave Stangy's watching in Michigan. Bill Whiting uh, is one of the local guys at uh, Snowbird. Bill's become a good supporter of our museum. Hazel Banks, you know Hazel, of course, former board member and supporter here. Dean's watching. Hey, Dean. He said he can beat you in basketball still <laughs> if you want to go play a game of horse somewhere. Uh, Cliff Watson is in uh, Pomona, Australia. Bruce Smith enjoyed our lovely conversation today. Bruce, he is a Apollo Brit that worked on the Bendix uh, experiments that are on the moon. Chris Kelly's watching. Hey, artist friend, Tom Celentano. Tom is looking at his bank account there, Steve, because he participates in our auctions. So he's going to see what uh, I'm I sure. hope that bank account is robust. We yeah, can use it. <laughs> that's right. As uh, as the one and only Chuck Jeffrey says, bid till it hurts. Yeah. All right. Uh, Cynthia Rossi, we got T-shirts in, young lady. We'll be getting in touch with you to get you your T-shirts. And Zubigan is watching. All right. So, Marty, a good list of people staying curious today with us. Uh, Steve, uh, you are now involved with a company called All Points. 
and uh, pulled this off their website there. Tell us a little bit about All Points. Well, All Points is, is a phenomenal company. When I uh, was able to leave the shuttle program after we finished with the transition and retirement, I, I, uh, I had a number of options and I decided that All Points was the right path for me. They're uh, a local small business that uh, has been deeply engaged in space activity for over 20 years. And so I thought it was an opportunity for me to join a, a great organization that was already well involved in doing the type of stuff that was interesting to me. And so, uh, again, I was fortunate to be able to join the company uh, in 2012. And uh, we've been uh, very engaged in a number of, of, uh, of the space programs that continue today whether it be here at KSC, helping with the infrastructure upgrades that we're doing. Uh, one of the, the main activities that we do uh, related to Artemis is we do a lot of the software development, working with uh, the Orion program and with Lockheed Martin and uh, with the Boeing company on the SLS side of things, the launch booster providing mm -hmm. IT hardware support at their the math facility. So we have a, a lot of tentacles into a number of programs. In fact, one of the things that uh, from a small business that not many can say is that I think that we were or have been involved in every human spaceflight program, I think for the for the last 10 years or so. So uh, a very dynamic uh, and uh, valuable business to, to the space program. Well, not many companies can claim that being involved in all areas of human space uh, flight. Uh, you've got a, a shirt on there, space prep. That is something that, uh, it, uh, you're involved with at all points. Yeah, so w one of the things that uh, we've embarked upon as the shuttle pro as the space program, not shuttle, the space program evolves is how do we participate and how do we support the future? So one of the activities that we've we've embarked upon is uh, to develop some uh, additional infrastructure and capabilities to support the whole commercialization uh, of space as we go forward and and we're designing, developing, implementing some uh, infrastructure and capabilities to support uh, payload and satellite processing, both uh, here on the Space Coast and in other locations. So Space Prep is, a, is a, an entity that we're standing up to uh, help amplify that capability and expand the, uh, the uh, support that All Points is providing across the ecosystem. They're on the cutting edge of so many things, uh, uh, All Points, as I met uh, some of the people that work there. What about the talent pool uh, that we're looking at as we're going into this new rocket renaissance? Uh, uh, I tell kids every day, do not go into liberal arts, all right? Go in and be an engineer so you can make some money. Uh, there are a lot of openings coming in down the pike here for well-paid jobs in engineering, logistics, uh, all these points here that, that you're involved in. Speak to the talent pool. Well, that America yeah. needs. Well, absolutely. You know, uh, anybody that pays attention, you know, the job market is tight out there. You know, the people that have long histories and a lot of experience in the space programs, they're starting to kind of fade out, you know, as the boomers do. So one of the things that we've been actively engaged in is, is how do we develop that next generation? You know, how do we make sure that that there's a, a talent pool that can do those types of things. And so the institutions that we partner with, specifically like UCF, they play a huge role in doing that. You know, one of the things that we do more specific is to to bring in co-ops and interns because you, you have to develop them, you have to grow them, you have to do it organically, right? You can't depend on those types of capabilities to, to materialize without the right type of mentoring and support. And so that's how we've been uh, supporting some of our internal activities is by the organic growth of of, uh, of the students that uh, that we're fortunate to identify. So the future looks good. Absolutely, you know the the. You know, and he, he mentioned UCF University of Central Florida. That campus has just grown leaps and bounds because of what's happened the last ten years. Oh, oh, absolutely. You know, uh, when uh, I was a product of UCF. And, uh, you know, when I went to school over there, we parked in, uh, in uh, fortunate to, to, to be connected and, and provide mentoring support to the students over there. 
and they're just one of a number of universities that we've worked with. You know, uh, Bethune Cookman up in Daytona is another university that we've worked with in the past, and FIT. Uh, so, uh, like I said out there, you got youngsters uh, getting into college age, get them into engineering there, and space engineering, and they're they're uh, uh, very rewarding jobs. Like Steve has told us here, you're helping our country. You're doing amazing things to push society forward. Yeah, space is cool these days, and so I think the 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 next generation is recognizing that and and are willing and and uh, very interested in getting engaged. Well, we're going to be engaged this far. This is a look at some of the concepts of the uh, Artemis uh, program. Uh, this is the starship uh, that uh, has the contract to go to um, the moon there. One one concept that I found on the Internet. Here's another one. There's actually two starships. The one on the left is called a Luna ship. That might be a permanent uh, Uber from the moon to the the uh, Lunar Gateway. Bet you didn't think out there that the Lunar Gateway was so small that it's eclipsed by the Starship, but that Starship's over 200 feet tall. That's a big vehicle. Yeah. Really big. And the dream is to take that to Mars. What do you think about these dreams out there? You've been on committees and, and involved with some of the, the, the uh, processing here of choosing these vehicles. What's your assessment of where we're at right now? and When will we go to the moon? Well, I've been extremely fortunate to have been involved in a number of evolving programs and support in different different capacities. But, you know, uh, it used to be uh, Buck Rogers type stuff. It's real now. I mean, you know, the Artemis One flight that we just had was a clear demonstration that we're getting closer, the gateway and uh, the lunar lander capability that uh, SpaceX is developing is just a clear demonstration that we're making progress by leaps and bounds and you know going back to the moon is not hypothetical anymore it's going to happen it's just a matter is it is it uh, two years from now or or three years but it will happen and so you know that's just a foundation to go back to mars or go to mars well you know baby boomers 50 years since we've been to the moon you know uh i'm taking all the vitamins and everything I can do to stay alive to see it hopefully the next few years there. Marty, we got a comment from our friends out there. Yeah, we have a comment it actually came from uh, Doug Forrest and Sagubin. Um, SpaceX a few minutes ago, uh, Starship completed the 33 engine static fire test. It's for duration was about seven seconds. Well, good. I heard that was going to happen today. The Starship that we showed here to leave the earth has 33 engines on it. All right, those uh, uh, engines, the, the Raptor engines, I believe they are, aren't they? Are they a different Mer engine? Raptor Merlin, Merlin, yeah, the Merlin, Merlin the Merlin, Merlin, Merlin yeah, the Merlin. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I heard that was gonna happen today. So he just fired them all together for six seconds. Just yeah, another perfect. step, right? Ophelia's watching today. Who else did you have there, Marty? Mick. Oh, Christopher Mick, he's a great educator in in Madison, Wisconsin. Well, SpaceX has done a tremendous job of helping leapfrog the space industry into a more commercialized environment, which is what it's going to take to do the type of things that humanity needs. So, you know, there's a, there's a continual migration from stuff that's being just purely government focused into more commercial environments to, to do the things in space that uh, everybody's hoping will occur. Would you literally Turn the lights out wherever you were working in 2011 on the camp on this, this I call it the campus out there, K Space Center campus. Did you think you would see uh, 57 launches in one year like we had last year? I don't know that anybody or very few people envision that renaissance that we had. You know, as we were going through that, you know, it was always a discussion about what we call the bathtub, you know, where we were at with a shuttle and how how the activity would, would ramp down before it ramped back up. And I don't think anybody expected the the level of return that has come to the, to the space industry uh, that we've enjoyed or, or witnessed over the last few years. So it's been phenomenal, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, when we uh, ended up closing down the shuttle program, you know, that was, in my, in my humble opinion, that was one of the greatest teams that will ever be assembled to do that type of work. The talent and everything was amazing. No doubt. Uh, but uh, I think we're seeing such a comeback with all the different players today that uh, 
that the talent that is out there and the interest that we're getting from the next generation that we we will see uh, phenomenal things and maybe replicate it. Who's to say? Yeah, it's it's amazing. The uh, I give credit to the, in a non political way to the Obama administration for initiating that and Bob Cabana, his leadership at Kennedy Space Center to transform. All Senator those Nelson, pads. Administrator Nelson and, now yeah. has always been yeah. a huge, huge advocate. Uh, and it all happened here in Florida instead of California or Texas or could easily move somewhere else uh, over a period of time. So uh, good insight here from Steve Lloyd. Marty, a, a parting comment? Uh, C. Gubin commented, <clears throat> excuse me, commented, Falcons use the Merlin engines, Starship uses Raptors. Okay, thank you. Yes, I stumbled over myself there. See, people are watching, right? listening. Got to have your facts straight here on Stay Curious. And uh, we will get our researcher educated about that when, when uh, I see them later today. So, no, but thank you very much. We love that you're interacting with Stay Curious. We love having people like Steve Lloyd on here. Where else can you hear from literally the horse's mouth about some of the aspects of the shuttle? And now you learn that you can stand up in those wings and they put sensors back in there. Did they use a Gorilla Glue or, or tabs to stick those in there, Steve? <laughs> well, I think it was a little bit more advanced than that. You know, uh, you know, we had, they were, they well, had I thought Gorilla Glue was a, a product of the advances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it had adhesive and mechanical bonding for all of those things because they were so critical and so sensitive. That's right. Well, I've enjoyed a conversation, getting to know you a little bit better and, and feel uh, so great with all points that the future of the America's uh, uh involvement in space is in great hands with leadership from people like Steve out there. Marty, any final thoughts there for our great Streamlabs job today, my friend? Nope. Looks like we're all caught up. Anything I didn't ask you you'd like to share? Well, thanks, Marty, for, for helping with this today. Uh, you're the, the, the behind the scenes guy that makes it all happen. Uh, so one plug for the Space Museum, if I could, you know, this is a phenomenal institution, as I mentioned earlier. So any involvement that you have, whether it be if you have an opportunity to come and spend some time here, the, the, the artifacts here are just mind boggling all the way back. So it would be well worth the time that you have if you can some, stop by and visit. Uh, if not, participate in the auctions. That's a good way for us to raise money. Or if you just feel like you want to join the organization, uh, we have the website that's always out there. So please support this organization. It's well worth it. And uh, this will be a mainstay of supporting our future. Well, thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Uh, when we say that we celebrate the birth of America's space age in its delivery room, we're in it in this museum. There are truly one of kind artifacts that you'll see nowhere else in the world. And it's a uh, great board members like Steve that are going to keep uh, uh, raising the bar for what we can do here uh, in our humble way. We, we know we have our own lane and under the leadership of Karen Conklin, uh, we're gonna stay in that lane and we're embarking on a great STEAM education program uh, every day here in this museum. It's just gonna get better. So thank you for your, your right. leadership nope. too. On thank that. you, proud to be part of it. Great, Marty, thank you all. And uh, we're tomorrow is Friday. We are going to do look at some backyard astronomy with me, Stargazer Mark. Can't wait to turn you on to the stars uh, from your own backyard. And we'll do that tomorrow. So until then, we can't wait to see you again in our museum or on Stay Curious to bridge the space between us.